Hello, welcome to Nerdist Book Club live on Nerdist and Geek and Sundry's YouTube, as well as Geek and Sundry's Twitch. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us, no matter where you're coming from. I'm Rachel Hine, and joining me, as always, are my longtime book club co-hosts and dear friends who I love talking to, Maude Garrett and Hector Navarro. Oh, I got, I can do that too. Woo! 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 Oh my god! Yeah, guys, I'm so ready for this. I'm in a mood. I know. I'm ready for wine. I'm ready for Star Wars. I'm ready to talk about books. Um, we are. If you are looking at these uh, and wondering what they are, this is Nerdist Book Club. It's a book club where we talk about books and drink wine with you at home, either live, hopefully, if you're joining us. But if you can't make it at a specific time you're somewhere else in the world you've got a job you're doing other things that's okay. maybe they're like 19 parsecs away you just don't know exactly oh no uh, oh begun. no it's begun this whole yeah. episode's gonna be mod star wars puns isn't no, it no it's never I, tell me the odds <laughs> 100 percent. i cannot wait i'm so excited about the book we're reading um we were formerly known as alpha book club for anyone who has followed us from ye old days of Alpha Book Club. We're so glad that you're here and that's what these wine glasses are. But um, thank you for joining us no matter how you found out about us. If you just realized that Nerdist was reading a Star Wars book and you've never seen our show before, welcome. Uh, we drink wine, we make puns, uh, we get into some spirited debates, we go on tangents and uh, we love to hear from you. So let us know what you're thinking of the book so far. Um, and we love each other and we love each other. We love each other like so. We text <laughs> all the time, and uh, you know, y'all are my rocks. Um, this is still. I said it at the three years ago, four years ago, whatever. Four years ago, Wednesdays are still my favorite day of the week because it's book club day, and and now we're talking about Star Wars. We've previously done a Star Wars book uh, way back in the day. We did one of the Thrawn books, but right now we're reading Bloodline by Claudia Gray. Um, it's a Leia-focused book that takes place six years before the events of Star Wars Episode Seven, um, The Force Awakens. And I'm just so excited. We're gonna dive into this book. Um, first off, Hector, I know you're reading, you have a physical copy, so you're reading the book book. That's right, baby. Dude, what an oversight. Put it down, get Audible immediately. Yeah, it is so good on no, no, Audible. No. It is so good. Four in it. Listen, I'm sure that it's amazing, but the oversight here is anybody who's not reading the book whilst listening to the specific playlist that I put together, that's the oversight. I... I am listening to the, on my iPod, the scores for episodes four, five, six, seven, eight, and I'll eventually add nine. Everything in the Skywalker saga that Leia was involved in, not including Rogue One, doesn't count. And that shit's on shuffle. So as I'm reading it, I'll all of a sudden get a little taste of Return of the Jedi. Then I bounce over to A New Hope. Then yeah, I go over to Force Awakens. it's correlating to the words. So Mod, you can have a really sincere so moment and have battle music and then bring the battle music. And Han score and it's so beautiful and breaks my And they so have sound effects that assist guys, and aid yeah. what's happening in the book. Sometimes it does correlate perfectly. Trust, trust. It's really, amazing. I the magic of your playlist and I <laughs> demand a link to it after this. <laughs> um. But I, Maud, yeah, I, I, if I had not been an audiobook convert, thanks to you many moons ago, this would do it. It has, we were talking about it before the show, it just made me like, oh, stop, because I know a lot of people have had mixed feelings about new Star Wars or just talking about Star Wars online. Personally, I just stopped doing it for a while. Yeah, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. And <laughs> men ruined it. Yeah. Men ruined everything. <laughs> not fun at all. But, um, listening to the score and getting more Leia can always take more Leia has just been like, it just feels like comfort book. It's just a com it's comfort book. And I'm, yes. I'm really excited that we are diving into this. So yeah. and the Leia narrator is actually really good. And if you want me to do, do the back of the book, I'll try and do it in. Life. I would love for you to, I had to 
look her up because she's read like 15 thrillers that I've listened to. I was like, I know this voice. Oh, that's cool. She plays with, yeah, I, she's great. Um, but yes, please, since there is more often than not an opening crawl for Star Wars, uh, Maude, would you do the honors of reading the back of the book crawl? Alrighty. <clears throat> When the rebellion defeated the empire at Endor, Leia Og, oh fuck, Oz, Organa, or <laughs> Organa or Organa? What is that one you think? Organa. Thank you. When the rebellion defeated the empire at Endor, Leia Organa be uh, believed lasting peace was at hand, a hope that now seems all but doomed. In her new role as senator, Leia must grapple with numerous threats to the fledging, fledgling democracy from underworld kingpin treacherous politicians and imperial loyalists to vicious partisans, partisan battles within the new republic itself. <laughs> now the Senate desperately seeks a strong political leader to heal the divided galaxy. But as the daughter of Darth Vader, Leia is wary of a single person wielding so much power, including herself. Yet it may be her only option for at the edges of the galaxy, a mysterious threat is growing. That sounded great. Hey, that was so good, and you sound just like her. Hey, <laughs> really I can well. hear it, but the, the words with ours, I'm like, I've never said them my whole life. Why would I start now? Uh, <laughs> June? Um, <laughs> hey, June. That's not that was. Dead. Um, sorry, that was one dick. Yeah, do it. Uh, so Claudia Gray, um, I've actually, I want to talk a little bit before we dive into the book about our Star Wars reading experiences, comics and books. Um, but Claudia Gray is an author who's been recommended to me by, I'm pretty sure Maude, you've recommended Lost Stars, yep. Amy Ratcliffe, Star Wars expert, Star Wars author, um, and Nerdist managing editor and great friend. Um, I... Uh, and as soon as I started reading this section, I messaged Amy uh, at work and was like, I need more recommendations for after this immediately. And she said, Claudia Gray, just more Claudia Gray. She's amazing. So she's a New Orleans based romance YA and paranormal author. So now I also want to read her non Star Wars stuff. Um, Claudia Gray is her pseudonym. She claimed she thought it would be fun to choose her own name and then confirmed it was indeed fun. <laughs> Good for her. I would like to choose my own. Yeah, name. What, what would be your pseudonym? If I was an author, it would probably be something like Reed Booker. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Really good. Uh, mine would be something very, so like New Orleans actually makes me think it would be like, <laughs> yeah. like Chloe or Raven, like De Debois or like something. <laughs> Raven de Bois. Mysterious in French. Yeah, Desplat. Um, Hector, what about you? I don't know. It's hard to, I'm really attached to the name Hector, actually, like very attached. Hector. I think it's perfect for me. I really like it. I don't know. That would be tough. I, uh, right, I have a better question. Can you yeah. picture or can you demonstrate General Grievous saying your name? Yes. I'll try. <clears throat> Hector Navarro. Hector. Hector. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys, I'm just talking about Star Wars. I know. This is so funny. I haven't even gotten it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so good. Um, and it's been, uh, yeah, I think Star Wars has been, has always been a contentious subject amongst fans. It's annoying. On the internet. And yeah. And especially for the new movies yeah um, and i think it's been hard for a lot of people who are i like at least for me speaking for me um loved the movies growing up knew every word um my best friend from high school who i'm still very good friends with to this day alex um lent me all of his legends books when we were in high school and read a bunch of those i never did legends I saw them. In, I remember seeing them in the library and in the bookshop and being like, I really want to get into this. Mm -hmm. But then like my same kind of apprehension that I have getting into comic books, mm -hmm. I never know if the book that I'm picking up is the first in the series, if yep. it's fourth down, what the best entry place is, which one was the first one. That kind of numer numerology got me a little bit intimidated. Uh, 
shocking. Totally. I, I was in the same boat. And a couple of years ago, I found this book. I think they put it out like 2012 or 2014 or something where Pablo Hidalgo wrote it. Who's a, who, he's a big Star Wars writer and like historian he is and the king genius. of canon. King yeah, of canon. He, he, yeah. he, he, put, he put together this book that was the um, it's a Star Wars reader's guide. And if you're watching this right now and you don't know about this, I highly recommend it. I mean, even when we were posting about, even when like Nerdist was posting about this book, people were commenting about, oh, this is canon, this is new canon, you know, talking, having that conversation. And one woman was like, what is canon? I don't know what this is. And I had to explain really briefly in a couple of tweets. I'm like, well, this is what it is. This is what it was. You can right? actually refer to my Canon video that I did on SourceFed Nerd, where I spent four, five, seven minutes talking yeah. about what Star Wars Canon yeah. is and why. It's, yeah. It's it's intimidating. It's this big exactly. thing. I'm exactly like you, Mod. I was also I've always been very intimidated by it. So then Pablo Hidalgo puts this book out, Star Wars Lucasfilm put this book out a couple years ago that was the reader's guide where it went through and in the timeline order, not necessarily by order of publication, but it tells you when they were published, That's gives you, it is an amazing book. I have it, I can lend it to y'all, but it gives you a summary. Yes, it and like Yoda's on the cover and it gives you a summary of every single Star Wars. What's that? Are they still canon now though? Because a lot no. of people but at the beginning, but no, they're not. But at, at the beginning of the book, it's specifically about all the books that were published before the Lucasfilm oh, Disney okay. merger yeah. or yeah, purchase. I, so I had Alex, the only reason I could do it was because Alex, who's right. So for those of us who this is my project, this is the next one you read, and I was yes. like, yes, great, thank you. So for those of us that didn't have an Alex, and for those of us who don't necessarily want to do like a Wikipedia deep dive, this book that I read cover to cover gives you every book and a summary of the book and a special note about the book. If it's like, oh, this was published, you know, in this way and da 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 da. Even little articles and stories that were written for Star Wars Insider Magazine are summarized in this book. Yeah. And, it, and I went from cover to cover and I just wrote down every book that I thought would be interesting. Yeah. None of them are technically canon now, but at the beginning of this reader's guide, Pablo Hidalgo, he, he lays out how like, even back then, the idea of canon was like, look, Lucasfilm is publishing these books, but if they ever decide to do a movie again, this was before the prequels, and if they ever decide to do anything else again, George Lucas and whatever he wants to do will supersede anything we've come up with. So this will very likely be contradicted. It doesn't matter. The important thing is whatever George Lucas wants to do. So when things got purchased by Disney, and Disney set out to be like, the rest of the novels technically no longer count. Now we're going to put them in print because we want to make money off of them. And we know that there are fans of them and we think they're great. But going forward now, every book that we publish, every comic book that we publish, every video game, everything that we do is going to be officially considered canon. I thought that was amazing. And people who complained no, that they I got rid of, yeah. People, that, people who complained that they got rid of the old canon, I'm like, technically guys, that old stuff was also contradicted as soon as George Lucas started doing the prequels. He yeah, introduced and ideas. It got very convoluted. And if people really wanted to be like that, guess what? Chewie died by a, mu a moon landing on him. Come on. Like, Come happy on. for that to not be canon. <laughs> well, also, I think the, the thing that confused me getting back into Star or trying to, every time I've thought about it, which is many times, um, is that then some of the elements of legends, I think it's called now, is that yeah. the end of the universe, um, are, have come back into canon. Yeah. Like we read Thrawn on our old book club. And I was like, wait, if that's, cause I loved the Timothy, original Timothy's on Thrawn books. Mm -hmm don't remember all of them but you know and so it, it I get I get overwhelmed but I, I love uh having a guidepost and especially now that the movies at least for now and the saga the Skywalker saga is sort of self-contained it feels a lot more manageable mm -hmm. um I'm just gonna turn my air on really quick it's okay <laughs> <laughs> what the, what? Yeah. But I think, I, I mean- I just posted my what is canon video in the oh. chat just then. And I oh, realized okay. it's coming up to its fifth year anniversary. I got wow. 137,000 views. And now I'm, I'm too scared to do this, but I'm going to say, what's the newest comment? Oh, okay. That's not so bad. <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> Mod, get out of there. Get out of there, Mod. It's a trap. <laughs> um, 
comments. Only book club comments are safe. It's a trap mod. Sometimes not even that. Oh. Um, I want to get all my Akbar toys. Go get them. Go get an Akbar toy. What are you doing? No, Go get an no, Akbar toy. I'll do, we have other shows. I'll do it. I already stood up once. Um, no, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I, but coming back to this uh, particular book. Oh, she's beautiful. Leia Bobby. Oh, that's nice. That's all. Yeah, I'll wait. I'll do it next time. I can contain myself. Um, but I think, uh, <laughs> this is sort of what I would like to see from the Star Wars, and I think The Mandalorian does a great job of this as well, uh, but this book so far, what we've read, which we'll get into, I promise, um, is what I would like to see from Star Wars in the future is different <laughs> genres and slice of life and political intrigue or, um, you know, character driven stories, which I think The Mandalorian definitely counts, but this is well getting to uh, be in the life of a beloved character at a time when we haven't seen her before, at least in the films. Um, and- I'm gonna one up you there. I missed her and I missed what, a, and I miss Carrie obviously every day, yeah. Fisher. And so, but I think her, the characterization of Leia in this as someone who is so smart and a little dry, doesn't really want to deal with, um, you know, protocol, but also really stubborn and isn't necessarily doing the right thing and working in a team and has to kind of learn from her own mistakes and her own. She wants to retire. You know, <laughs> like, I just, I, loved it. I was like, you're not always right but you think you are, and so does Han, and you guys are, like, I just, I love the characterization of her in this, so we can dive uh, into it, but what do you think, Ron? I have a question. I, I love delving back into Leia and fleshing her out a lot more because it was a, not, not necessarily one-dimensional in the original trilogies because she was very assertive, uh, but then was made a love interest. Um, but I would like to pose to chat and to everyone here, have you ever read a sci-fi or fantasy book from the perspective of a woman in her late 40s or even in her 40s. Mm. That's a great point. That is a gr excellent that point. That was a point of view for me. Yeah. I was like, I haven't read this before. And there's no, I mean, there's, she's still with Han, which I'm also fascinated by just like when- How their marriage works. He dropped the ball. When did it fall? I, yeah. yeah. I have a theory. I have a theory because none of you guys have read Bloodline before, right? All three of us have never read it. Yeah. Okay. I have a theory and I don't know how. They're having an affair. And no, hair. no, my, no, my, never. They're Disney characters. No, uh, my theory is I'm not sure how tapped into the making and writing of like The Force Awakens or beyond Claudia Gray was, you know, tapped Couldn't into. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But. I do know that this Bible, like there is yeah. a, within that world, I like think this, there, this... there are people to let you know, if not a character, like if not exactly what happens in the movies, but a character path or a hit, whatever is relevant this, to what you're writing about. Yeah. This came out 2016 originally. Okay. And I think this paperback version, it says 2017 and Force Awakens was 2015. And then what we learn later about Luke and Ben when they're training and how everything goes to shit, that happens in later movies. But the important thing is that framework is still there. My theory is right now Han and Leia are together. At some point in the future, and it's probably not going to be in this book, when yeah. everything goes bad with Ben, that's when they break up. Because Ben being lost to the dark side or Snoke is going to be that painful thing where Han is going to retreat back to being a smuggler. He can't yeah. look at Leia. Leia can't look at Han. You yeah. know, they remind each other of their son who they lost and they didn't fight hard enough for. That's that's my theory. And it's and it's and it's awesome and heartbreaking and I love it and ben. and Ben Solo Kylo Ren is one of my favorite characters who I think is so compelling so for that sorry. reason. Yeah. So Also the name Ben I just realized Ben did, did that have anything to do with Obi-Wan's alias? Yes. It did. Yes, Ben Kenobi. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but but like Han didn't really spend right? too much time. And neither did Leia. But you know what I like is in this book, we talk about how it's very Leia. For them. It's but they very... never knew him as Ben. They only knew him as Obi-Wan. Sure. And Luke 
had known him as old Ben the whole time. And they knew him for, a, for Han Solo knew him for a second yeah. before he was killed by Darth Vader. But in this book, the character of Leia, she talks about how Han Solo cared so much about Luke. Yeah, He took him in under his wing. And I'm like, how have I never considered that? That's so true. Yeah. It's so true. And I think that the naming of their son to be Ben is just a gift for Luke. It's just for Luke to be like, because by that point, Luke and Leia had realized that they're siblings, because this is after Return of the Jedi, that yeah. by that point, they had been fighting in a rebellion for years. By that point, do you know what I mean? By that point, it, 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 it becomes oh. this trio where Han and Leia love each other, Luke is there, yeah. And they're, they're all so young and they're all coming from just different kinds of trauma and having to survive and all of these um, different places. And it's sort of like a very juvenile way to think of it, but like camp, like summer camp, but in a war, in a war. Um, or like, like tech week when you're a theater kid or whatever, like when you're young and you spend all this time together, yeah. there's probably another analogy that's less fucking dorky, but. Um, <laughs> Tech camp? <laughs> no, not tech camp. Well, I did go to theater. I did go to and then teach a theater camp. But um, that's a story for another day. But the the idea that being young and and thrown into like just you're together nonstop and sort of on your own for the first time uh, is again a very juvenile way to put it. But I think that like sort of bonding where even if it's a short amount of time, it you saved each other, you found each other, you learned about each other, you learned about yourself through them learning you. Like, I just think their their arc their, in, in the original trilogy is so powerful because they, and we as the audience, get to know them through them getting to know each other. Um, but let's get into the book, let's get- Where's R2 in this book? There's a lot of C3, where's R2? He's with Luke. He's with Luke. Remember? That's right. In the Force Awakens flashbacks, when the temple falls, it's that robotic hand that comes up to touch. They've thought of it all. They've thought of it all. <laughs> I just, I also- This not be lost 2.0. They did not think of it all. Well, I, I also want to, um, no. before, we, before we do jump into the book, I just want to very quickly, first of all, very nice comment from Jimmy Sprinkles, who says, you explaining about canon is now canon, Hector. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, but I wanted to, between the three of us, really quickly talk about where we are with Star Wars stuff now, like extra stuff, in terms of this is not the first new book that I've read. I've read a couple, but I actually, yeah, right, yeah. I bought a bunch of them, and I and this was one that I bought, which is why I have the physical version, but I was it was sitting on my shelf, and I hadn't read it yet, so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get to it. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I, and I've also only read a few of the older canon stuff. I read, when I was younger, a Han Solo book that I adored, which I still have, and I and I still consider something that I like more than the Han Solo movie, which was fine. And then I also read the first book in the Thrawn trilogy, but I read that as an adult like a few months ago, and I'm like, I didn't love it. And that's a real bummer because it was something that when it came out, it like, it changed the game in a way. So just real quick before we dive in, I am a huge fan of, all of the extra stuff, and again, of Disney kind of really putting their foot down and being like, no, 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 now going forward, we're gonna try to consider this as canon as much as we, as, yeah, as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And it and because it's really kind of a smaller list than it was you know, before Disney bought it, it does feel kind of manageable. I love the comic books. I love, even if there's books that I've read that I didn't love. There are a lot more now. I feel like there are yeah. so many. Yes, there are. And there then they also lot. do kids' books, yeah. I'd like a timeline of novels to start. Yeah, I can get that to you. There's a wiki on that and it's awesome. Yeah. Wikipedia, and they're all over I, it. I think um, this is another thing that I've been meaning to, you can't see it right now, but my uh, setup is cropped on the Dark Crystal board game. But the when Dark Crystal Age of Resistance came out, uh, not only did I name my baby son Cat. Uh, after a character, but uh, they had a whole Hup. timeline. Hup, a little spoon. Um, he's a paladin, but uh, <laughs> they had this whole timeline because it's a prequel thousands of years before the original movie, and it showed kind of just 
and I haven't dug into it because I've been listening to a lot of thrillers, but um, I, I need that for Star Wars because I would really like to chronicle, and I need to do this with Clone Wars and Rebels. I'm bad. I have Ooh, and here's, here's the other thing I want to say. Full order, right? Yes, I am, I am 1000% in the same boat as you, Rachel, and I found this timeline and I've kind of been obsessed with it and I've been slowly making my way, but I was going to say, what I was going to say is this. I feel that the perfect viewing order for Star Wars is to Wait, do the- Wait, write an article for Nerdist. I might, but my, my take is this, to watch the core nine movies first in theatrical release order. Yes. So you right. go four, five, six, one, two, yeah. three, seven, eight, nine. And then yeah. once you do those nine core movies, and this is really what I'm thinking in terms of like, even how to share it with like kids. I'm not a parent, but this is my theory. I would love some feedback on this. Right. Show the kids, show the kids these nine movies first and then go back to the beginning chronologically. And even before you watch episode one, read every book and comic book that's canon and watch every TV show that's canon in order. So okay, you so like now that the kids are 29. What yeah. Should... <laughs> uh, I mean, it seems like it would take a long time, but it's kind of and I know we've talked about this before on Alpha really Book Club. That much, so it, it it's right. kind of. It's it's like my fantasy to at I'm some to, books ahead of my year schedule because I don't sleep and I exactly listen. exactly it <laughs> seems like a lot it seems like a lot but in the past few months before Disney Plus got the new season I did watch all of Clone Wars in chronological order yeah, you know I, I mean? am doing that but I'm yeah. only up to season oh, I don't even think I've finished season one yet because there's like twenty something in the first season sure, and then it drops sure. back. It's just, it's worth it. And I think that all of the extra material, the books, the comic books and the TV shows obviously enrich the world. And to do that in order, can you imagine showing a kid the nine movies and then going back and being like, here's a bunch of cool stuff. Here's the Clone Wars cartoon show. Here's the movie Rogue One. And it ends right before A New Hope. Let's rewatch A New Hope. Yeah, yeah, do you know what I mean? That with all that information. <sighs> yeah. That's a big ask. There's a lot out there. I mean, this is Nerdist, Geek Mom, Geek and Sundry, all of us together, like diving into lore and history and like how things connect is like my favorite. That's why I loved, I mean, Lost is one of those, but yeah. Um, Maud, how do you feel about getting into canon? And chat, let us know as well. Yeah. So um, when the uh, Force Awakens was, I think about to be announced from 2014, I started hosting a Star Wars podcast. So I would be all over the news from that. And then um, I hosted a second one. And then with that, we would review all the canon comic books and books. So I was reading as fast as I could. Pre Force Awakens canon or post? Like, like new canon or old canon? No, no, no. Legends were... Extended yeah. Universe? No, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Everything that was getting released, yeah. I was consuming Got it. Apart, apart from children's books, coloring books, like all that kind of stuff. But if it was a comic book, if it was a um, an actual novel and yeah, all of that kind of stuff. So I read Lords of the Sith by Paul S. Kemp, which I really liked. Again, that was on Audible. And that's when I was like, oh my gosh, they've got access to all of the Lucas films and like all the LucasArts soundboards. Yeah text chain after the ones that you liked so I can good yeah things. yeah because some of them are a bit tough there's this one here which I do not recommend uh oh that's Thrawn there you are uh oh Era Ed of the Jedi by Kevin Hahn oh Go back. yeah I didn't I didn't finish that one it was tacky um, and Paul S. Kemp does a really good job about it, but he brings the action. And I really like the um, the dynamic that he has between Palpatine and Vader and how you realize the lack of power that Vader really has and that he's just a puppy puppet. Like he's just, I, that was really, really cool to see unfold because when I was a kid watching the movies, Vader was the be all end all. He was the top of the tier bad guy. He was the numero uno. And then now it's just like, no, no, no. He was- He's middle like, management. He was sent off to do things. And there's a couple of times where he didn't want to do something or he like, felt wrong or whatever it was, but because he was ordered to do it, he had to execute it. And that was very much president and military kind of dynamic on that front, which I thought was really interesting. 
Uh, Lost Stars by Claudia Gray is my favorite Star Wars canon book. It tells a story of two pilots. Sorry? It's, ro it's rom romantic. It is. So it's kind of like the Romeo and Juliet in the Star Wars universe where two kids from the same uh, planet go through the empire system. So when I would do the podcasts, a lot of questions that we would ask people are, what would you like to see like focused on? Because we have so much information out there. There's a lot of worlds. There's a lot of characters. What would you like to focus on? And the big one that I always had was like, how do you become one of these faceless people in this giant corporation? Like, you obviously get the job. And so this kind of shows that these two pilots that go up into the system be to become Thai pilots. And one of them is so loyal to the empire and is doing really well and is like eye on the prize. Questions only sometimes why an entire planet had to be destroyed. Yeah. So it was like that kind of like, uh, they obviously know what's going on. I'm working for them. Therefore, like this feels a bit weird. And then that was the catalyst point for the guy to be like, fuck this. Like this is a tyrannical, like awful thing. So many people have died. I can't fight for these people anymore. So he defects. And it's seeing their relationship because they are best friends. And then that relationship goes even further when they realize that they are in love. That's and my she will not like her unwavering loyalty, he can't get through to her. Whereas she can only see him as a traitor to the thing that they fought for. So it's a really, really well-written book. It's it feels very, like in terms of gender dynamics, you would assume that those roles would be reversed, which I yes. find really fascinating. And uh, I, I think the chat definitely agrees. David Nichols Jr. says, I like the idea that all the legends is what regular people who live in the Star Wars canon universe think of as true sometimes, ties in with the new tr the themes of the new trilogy very well. Tim and Daisy said, yeah, lore. You're right, Tim and Daisy. Uh, I've been watching Clone Wars and Rebels, finished Rebels on season five, and on season five or six of Clone Wars. Miss Necromancer says, shift supervisor, Darth Vader. Yeah. to Ray Slither Claw. I, guess. Um, I also, well, another thing that I really wanted to see expanded is like, because this was a pitch that everyone was always saying, what book do you want to see? And my answer would also be, I mean, Old Republic, blah, blah, blah. But I was like, Leia killed basically the head of a crime fan. Like, this is, they have been running and ruling, like, the huts for generations have so many districts and planets that they are in control of and she has toppled that uh the system and the order there and i wanted to know what the repercussions were for that because it was disgusted so when i was listening to this i was like there it is that's what i wanted to know i wanted to know of the consequence of that action because it would have had catastrophic effects um throughout the galaxy so then yeah. That was my segue to bring us back into this. Let's talk about the characters. No, I, I, I think it's what I want from future Star Wars and what I would like if they let Ryan Johnson make his Star Wars, which they should, please. Um, please let him make it. Don't listen to the mean boys. Um, <laughs> uh, it made a lot of money. So, uh, but is to explore other genres, to explore those smaller moments and, um, it's sort of like adventure the West way. Like, I just love the sort of machinations I know in the prequels, not necessarily executed in the right way of why war happens and what is happening behind the scenes. But the, I feel like we, we talked internally about what book we wanted to read next. And we were like, let's read something fun. We loved the last two, and it is fun, not to say that none of it, that we've yeah. been very challenged but it is a very challenging time <laughs> but <laughs> yet this book is extremely relevant <laughs> to today it's yeah. so but i love i mean i'm very excited because you know it's not we don't want fluff we just want to enjoy what we're reading and try different things but i when i was listening to it i was like Artifacts, Empire artifacts. Yep. Yeah. Even even uh, more relevant today. Like centrists and how anyone 
and populists. Like even the name I love. Yeah. Um, you but I, power for good or not use it enough. I mean, a little shook in terms of American democracy right now, but yep. um, let's- uh, but can we, I, I wanna draw some parallels because the last time that I have explored this much political banter where it really focuses on the system in terms of like of the political structure, the last time we really, really saw that was episode one with the Trade Federation. And yes. it was written in such a void way, a yeah. void of empathy, yeah. void of purpose. Like they were just trying to say that it was a position of power, blah, 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 blah. But oh my gosh, even watching that back now, it's like, this is so not how to talk about politics. Like I am tuning out. This is yeah. like, I mean, you have incredibly racist aliens, like all of this kind of stuff. But reading this and seeing both sides presented and neither being right and wrong, like both were right and both were wrong. And I kind of loved having that discussion. And I truly believe it's because Claudia Gray writes from an emotional point of view. She's not presenting facts. She's presenting the facts and then the feelings that come from it. Yeah. From a certain point of view? From a ah. certain point of view. But the fact that you're getting both views and you're understanding where she's coming from and why she has all this information and why this is so important to her, but then another argument being presented to her and her bias getting in the way. And she's so kind of tunnel visioned on what she's experienced, but then also frustrated that someone's coasting through without having experienced it and not really understanding the gravity of what they're saying. Gravity. Um, I really liked how they spoke about their political viewpoints. And I think that that is almost inspirational for people to present their arguments and actually have a conversation where you cannot point blank disagree with everything, but then try to find a common ground moving forward. And, and seeing that there can be nuance and I don't know that that's possible in our current system, but mm -hmm. I think I, I, I agree. And I think that it, it uh, growing up, my dad's a, he's a labor lawyer, but he was very into Marx growing up democratic. He's always like, I was a democratic socialist before everyone knew who Bernie was. Um, his claim to fame uh but we would talk a lot about socialism and democratic socialism and how there are a lot and and capitalism and all of these different uh ways to unify society that in theory in theory makes sense but it's humans or people when you have aliens involved that have to make sure that that happens that have to get into that position of power to enact it and unfortunately human nature not always so great and it ends up you know and i think the idea that as soon as as the book introduces as we're diving into it you know leia is a senator she is of the populist movement which is essentially planet with their own cultures and laws should be able to um, govern themselves. Mm -hmm. Centrists, a little bit more pro-military, a little bit pro- uh, Tyranny. <laughs> yeah, tyranny. But, but, and so you're coming at it from that, per from Leia's perspective, which you totally understand, which is that uh, people I knew died. My entire planet was blown up my childhood, my life, everything. I learned who my father was, like all of this, you know, we all know what happened. Mm -hmm. And she is coming from an understandable perspective of, no, I don't want anyone to have any kind of power like that. I've seen absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. You can't trust anyone. But she's also super frustrated with her own party, the populace, right. because it feels like, well, where is the line if you're just focusing on yourself and there's another planet or another system or of people right. who need your help. And it's so, you know, I think having two sides, much like the force bringing balance, you know, we're talking about balance. There should be a middle ground. There should be a United Nations of <laughs> the Republic, but it's this, you know, it didn't turn out this way in Rise of Skywalker, but I think the Jedi, from my point of view, the Jedi are well, no, um, the, the Jedi are too dogmatic. They're yeah. cultists. The Sith yeah. are too chaotic, and you need you need both elements of that. And I think Ray all day. 
introduces the political system in that way too of you do need to be able to be a little more flexible and listen to each other and maybe get involved when it makes sense but don't you know collect space nazi memorabilia i want to bring that up because <laughs> i want to bring that up because not only does that element make this book more relevant today than when the book was first published but i have a question to everybody into the chat is the plot thing of the senator ransom casterfo who's a very interesting character and i think is somebody who by the time we get to the section where we're in right now where we finish chapter eight i think he's very likable i think that he's somebody who yes. Who we well, now just get at the start, but you yes. weren't supposed to like you him because he was get to people. Perspective until yes, let he so, like bum, ba, na, na, yeah, he, he, and like oh shit. <laughs> he can be heroic, and the, like as we're describing, when they actually get into a discussion about their ideologies, he's right but wrong. Leia's right but wrong. There's a lot of middle ground, and it is very inspirational. My question is: Is this? Do you think that if Claudia Gray wrote this book today? that she would have this same character be hanging on to empire memorabilia, knowing that it would cause such a connection for the reader between people who we have today who defend the Confederacy of the United States and its memorabilia. Or do you think that Casterfo, because I've never read this, is going to end up being, because as soon as we are introduced to him in his office and we did see memorabilia from the empire and he said oh it's just historical i immediately went this guy is yep. a fascist in training this yep. guy is doesn't care about history he actually is ad, ad, admiring what the empire did and he's going to be somebody who believes in what palpatine did and how he was and he's a fascist in training symbolism. yes so, I, so I think this is a necessary moment and i think the fact that it's happening now is a very good thing like i mentioned earlier claudia gray presents both sides of the argument but then showcases the feelings that are associated with them. And in that particular moment, Castelfo had very limited feelings. He was nonchalant about it. He wasn't yep. really defensive of it. It was a little bit matter of fact to him. I wasn't there. Action figures. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's like, I wasn't really there, but I kind of you know, know the empire and I remember hearing the stories and it is what it is. But then you see a visceral reaction from Leia. It is like being hit in the gut. She's probably perspiring in this moment. She's oh, going through so much trauma. And for him to be so detached in that moment and for her to have that sort of reaction, it shows both sides. And when it's like, well, it means nothing to me, it doesn't mean that it means nothing to everyone else. It can mean a lot. And I really liked that association of the trauma there because Leia is showing and she gets so reactive about it and she's going, what are you doing? And because he was dismissive of her trauma, A, unlikable, but B, he wasn't actually experiencing the gravity of the situation. And I think from that moment, I didn't necessarily see him as a fascist in training. I saw him as someone who was uneducated. I saw him as super green. Yeah. And he, you know, the modern day equivalent is the 15 year old kid who kind of gets swept up in the right a little bit online. Yep. Yep. And he's just a little bit conditioned and people told him it was a good thing. So he's him celebrating it with his people is his normal. But then he's- such a slippery, slip. I, I yep. think she would probably, I mean, I don't want to speak for her, but I think that it's actually very spot on that he is a likable character who is not indoctrinated yet. And maybe he doesn't become indoctrinated, but he is a, a ripe for the picking. He is an angry teenager on 4chan. Not to be, I'm not trying to be reductive, but like there, there, there are many types of ways for horrible people or movements to prey on people and there were a lot of normal people in nazi germany yep and it happened slowly until it's happening there are many quotes and articles and books and museums and essays about it where if you are not careful and if you follow the status quo and if you don't have that kind of empathy and you think about things in that abstract it could be, I mean, I don't understand it, but it could be easy depending on your background, depending on your level of knowledge and how you were raised to get swept up in that and become like you were saying in Lost Stars. It, it, it's a slow burn 
And yeah. that could be on a huge political level. It could be on a personal level. People are always like, how did someone stay with this person that was clearly abusive? And it's like, well, it's, it didn't happen overnight. That's a lot. You know, that is exactly the point that you're saying. These people don't wake up and they're like, Trump is God no. and death to yeah. all, you know, other sure. races. It's, it's a slow burn and it has to start somewhere. And this um, Kostjerfo character, it's he's starting. He's new into this kind of journey and he's being kind of swayed in that direction. And because Leia is a lot further down, she's kind of like recognising this and is needing to have the conversation and bring awareness. But I just don't think Kostjerfo knows enough and he kind of admits it. But yep. I think that, you know, the, what I'm really appreciating is these characters who are, very left and very right and disagreeing and their fundamentals do not align and they cannot agree and that argument is rife seeing better qualities in the others over time yes. understanding yeah. that ransom even though like don't tag anyone don't put a tracking device on because that's an an absolute like <laughs> obliteration of someone's privacy and rights whatever but the fact that he stepped in and was willing to kind of like whoa what are you doing we're in a gnarly situation i'm going to risk my life to help you and she kind of goes, oh, he's actually not like going to save the day. And like that, I, I also like that. I think that's the first time we get his perspective. So we're seeing him as how Leia sees him. And obviously, like, I, I, I don't even think I would be able to reconcile with having a bunch of space Nazi memorabilia in your home and inviting the senator princess whose entire family, like, just, well, I guess he didn't, didn't invite her, but still just, uh, but we get his perspective when he's like, I was worried about her and I put a tracker on her and I did all the right things. And then he realizes it was a sting he wasn't included on. He's like, well, shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I do like that he, he kind of figures out how to bounce back. Um, Miss Necromancer, uh, said in the Discord that Ransom reminds me of Rolf in The Sound of Music for this very reason. Mm. He's older than that character, but his youthful ideals are very parallel. Spoiler yeah. alert, Ralph. Yeah. Sing song, becomes a Nazi. Not good. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good analogy. I mean, that's, that's it's his great, It's such a good one. And uh, I will say something that sets him apart, though. Like, and he already has shown a saving grace where it's like, I'm not agreeing with this guy, rubs me the wrong way, pompous git. Um, you know, has those old school chivalry where it's like you can't see her as an equal and has to rescue her, blah, 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 blah. Oh, no. When they had their big boof and they really went head to head and had a massive argument and Leia like was vulnerable and quite, you know, emotional to him, even though he said she was overreacting, don't ever do that. It is a normal reaction. They are just reacting. Um, he gave the next day after he was able to calm down, he gave a very sincere apology yeah. where he admitted what he had done was wrong and he learnt and listened to what she, she had said yep. and he allowed room to be wrong and to grow and change. And that is a quality. And her, and her, I, that, that was what I liked and she almost was thinking to herself, I should introduce him to my populist pals so we can bridge this gap because yeah. he's willing to listen. I think, yep. and I think that's something we can relate to on obviously a political level, but also like a fandom level. Sometimes I'll try to engage with someone online and it rarely ever works out, but I still try sometimes if they seem like they might not just. Yeah. Be in bad faith. And it has happened before, but saying yeah. it where it's like, Hey, you may not understand my perspective. Here's what it is. It doesn't mean it's yours. Yeah, but the feelings are very real and genuine. You know what it you know what it reminded me of that sequence and 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 the way that Leia started to sort of think about him reminded me of when Carrie Fisher and um, uh, Admiral Holdo, played by the amazing Laura Dern in Star Wars: The Last Jedi, like like knocked out uh, Poe Dameron, and as he's being oh. carried in the thing, they look to each other and they're like. I like him, me too. Even though he had like, yes. right, broken the rules yes. and was going behind their back. And yeah, he almost staged, open. they staged, he almost staged a coup. Yeah. They yeah. still recognized in him, he's trying to be a hero and he is doing this for the right reasons, even if he is misinformed or doesn't have all the information. And, they, and they yeah. talk, you know, and I, yep. oh, there was such a debate over that too. And I, 
I remember even with friends of mine who are um, dudes and yeah. <laughs> very feminist and awesome allies mm-hmm. and supportive and just- They were like, she should have told him. him. Not even, not even that, but just like, you know, not quite understanding. And the moment that Poe, and I'm a, I love Poe in Me many too. ways. Me um, too. A beautiful man and also just lovely um, and a hero. But it, as soon as he walked up to Holdo yeah. and tried to kind of, you know, tell her what to do and was a, you know, a scoundrel, which I also love. As soon as that happened, I was like, she doesn't owe you anything. She doesn't have to tell you shit. She's an admiral. She's replacing a king, a squid. <laughs> a squid. <laughs> I, was really, I was really upset when that happened. But I, yeah. I, I didn't I, even notice really, it did happen. It was like that. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what war is like. That's what I told myself. Even uh, though- okay, that's a good way to sleep at night. Yeah. And listen, for Some all of the for all of the war failings, the word that Admiral Akbar is gone. They yeah. could have said one, but it's fine. For all of the, by the way, how great was that little cameo in this book where old ass Admiral Akbar is walking around with a cane and Leia's like, I want to go talk to him. That's my friend. <laughs> and he was like pushing eighty. I- but the, but what's so great about this? and other things like it is that for all of the failings of the new Star Wars movies, which I see a lot of the discourse online is about their failings. No, but there's I, really good parts and good characters. Yes, but I feel like, yes, the prequels are kind of a different animal and the people who ignore those movies' failings just to prop them up, I'm like, yeah, I think you're doing that in bad faith. I don't think that's an accurate, fair thing. They're bad. The original- I love them. <laughs> sure, the original Star Wars movies, the three that everybody holds up to be perfect and many times without flaws and so immaculately planned and everything, I think honestly have as many uh, failings and, and things that fall through the cracks as the new movies for better and worse. Like both of these sets of movies did stuff without planning them fully through and you can kind of tell and you can kind of see the cracks. I mean, when we read this at this and like Maud was saying that you get to actually see Leia actually process her killing Job of the Hut, which I'm like, the original movie never talked about. No. It all, all it does is enhance the original movie. And I feel like the new movies, even though we got to see Admiral Akbar die like this off screen and it was so, so quick, I feel as though there has to be some comic book or some book out there right now somewhere that actually kind of goes over it and will oh, make it better. I'm just happy we got him in The Force Awakens and I yeah. literally screamed <laughs> loud in the screening it, I did not mean to. I thought it was an inside thought. I screamed, it's a trap. <laughs> in, the, in a press screening. And according to this, he would have been 90 in The Force Awakens or something. Like, that's impressive. <laughs> um, <sighs> I also want to talk about, oh my God, Anthony Carboni. Love Hi, that buddy. Akbar cameo. Thanks for coming, bud. Um, I also love that... Uh, we get some new, some like youngin characters in this. Yeah. And I want some of the oh, books yeah. that I read in the prequel era books that I read. Um, one of which involves a Yoda impersonator. I just remembered when we were Googling it before the show. Uh, yeah, Yoda Dark Rendezvous. It's in between no. episodes two and three. Yoda and Dooku, a little situation. <laughs> There's basically a Yoda impersonator who's used as a, a decoy. Ah, but was uh, it was it Yaddle? Because that's the only way that will make sense. No. Is if it was the female Yoda. Nope, not Yaddle. Um, do love Yaddle though. Maybe it was a uh, tool like a shorter stature. But the the I love getting new characters outside of. I the, thought I was pretty PC about that, but I mean the coloring and the skin consistency. No, Jesus, cats. Um, things are. <laughs> Have you guys ever seen um, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street? No. <laughs> That's what he's doing. Um, no, but I like I like also the addition of new characters, including uh, who I'm thinking of is Tom Hiddleston. Um, uh, oh, Costarfo. Yeah. I am picturing, and I showed Lee this, I don't know if anyone's played Fire Emblem Three Houses, but Sylvian in that is giving me big time 
uh, ran some vibes. And also, and this is going out to all my Lost Stars readers because we actually covered it on Geek Bum Book Club. So a lot of my long times, we've all been through it. Only one, one chat, but mm, had a lot to say. But Nash Windrider, he is another one who was on the uh, in the Empire fleet as a pilot, and he was from Alderaan. And this was a oh, I don't want to spoil it. Um, yeah, don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. Yeah. Yeah. But he was also it. quite uh, well off, and he was like on a higher sort of like echelon. He was quite pompous. So I got Nash vibes. Anyone in the chat? You let me know. That's you pretty good. Me. You know what? Oh, you know who I'm picturing is. Casterfo, and I probably shouldn't be, but because they described him in this way, at least sounding this way, I'm picturing like a young, hot Moff Tarkin. Like I'm picturing like a young <laughs> Grand Is Admiral. Is that such a thing? I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah, in my mind, a hot, yeah. A hot Tarkin? Yeah, those yeah. cheekbones. You may have and brother. Yeah, you, you, yeah, uh, in more ways than one, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, you leave those no, on no, torpedoes. <laughs> I mean, just of, uh, it's Peter Cushing. There is yes. young Peter Cushing uh, in, you know, Universal Monsters movies. I will find, I mean, not hot, but like scary hot. No, he's not No, hot. there's like, oh God, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Um, Are you looking up pictures of young Peter Cushing? No. Did we just swap? <laughs> if you've if you've changed that, hold on yeah, three seconds. I, I accidentally clicked stop. Yeah, you did. You swapped. Okay, that's cool. So if you're watching this, uh, swap Rachel and Hector's I'm name. Awesome. I'm still the same though. I'm the captain okay, now. I, I just clicked it uh, wrongly. Um, I want to keep talking about the book, but I also just want to say one thing, which is that as much as I love Peter Cushing and Moff Tarkin, uh, they should have given all of the CG Moff Tarkin. Uh, yeah, he's he's a, he's a he looks like Tom Hiddleston. He could get it. He could get it. Tom Hiddleston, but should have given all of the CG <laughs> Moff Tarkin moments in Rogue One to Ben Mendelsohn and his cape. Mendo. Mendo. The love of Mendo. Um, right. I also want to talk about uh, not just the audio book, but we're, so we're we're getting into the underbelly of post original trilogy, pre sequel trilogy. Whoa, this is young Christopher Lee, by the way. What the f? Oh, That's not a f. He can do cool. I'm so sorry that I said no. <laughs> no pigs. <laughs> I hate it. Um, no, but I, I really like that in in Star Wars, especially in the new uh, sequel trilogy, whatever it's called, um, a lot of people got upset in The Last Jedi when they go to Canto Bight. Yes. Oh, we spoke about that, Hector. Mm -hmm. You defended and Canto Bight. And I just was like, all you had to do was just give uh, Justin throw more screen time. That's fair. That's Not fair. even a big ask. Not even a big ask, you know? <laughs> I think that um, looking at war profiteering as a concept, I wish that Ryan, I think my, my main critique of The Last Jedi, which is a teeny tiny one, is that it should have been two movies. Just give him two mm -hmm. of them. Hmm. Um, because there are so many ideas that I think are worth exploring. And one of them is what is the cost of this type of a war, Galactic whether you're on the side totally. of the rebels or the empire or totally. the first order. Mm -hmm. And what I like about this is they're in, they're in the Senate. I love the throw away line ish about we we gave up the weird senate bubbles because they they made people seem so self-important i was like but that has such a that's one of the greatest prequel scenes is when they're like oh yeah oh, just fighting through <laughs> um because you know, uh, we've got another little bit of extra time here and maybe i'll go into it more on the after show but i just want to let you guys know and i'm not sure if i brought it up before but it's worth mentioning I actually read part of the script that Ryan Johnson wrote for The Last Jedi before it got 19 edits on it. And there was an amazing Leia story that involved the Knights of Wren 
where she had to pick up a saber to defend herself. So I will tell you what went down in that scene in the after show. Remind me. But when you say that we should have had two Can new I re-subscribe <laughs> to Geek Bomb Justin? That's a... Well, and I, know and I wasn't allowed to say anything. I got to read it on an iPad and I was just like, all right, this is what I want. And then even though I really liked The Last Jedi, I did. I was really hoping to see that dynamic. And I I think I've made it very clear. I didn't like Kylo Ren as an antagonist at all. And I thought if he was flanked with the Knights of Ren, that would have been a powerful entity because mm. it would have been like what we saw in Return of the Jedi with all the bounty hunters going after Han. You would have had that level of suspense in The Last Jedi. So that's like one of the things I'm a little bit bummed about, but I'll tell you, yeah, what, what, um, what the scene was as I recall it, yeah. God, um, I don't know how to refocus my brain after that, but um, well no, I think I, I, I like that this, and what I would like to see in, uh, oh gosh, um, in any kind of Star Wars, future Star Wars story is these personal moments and what it means, or, or societal moments, what it means to, um, different groups. And so the premise of Leia's whole mission is this uh, idea that, you know, after a crime syndicate is taken out, guess what? People are going to fill that void. And y you can't just pretend like, okay, we're done. I mean, in terms of American politics, we could probably have like a week long conversation about that. Um, and removing leadership in some way and then being like, bye. Um, but the fact that she views this as a way to sort of make her government work worthwhile, something she can do and kind of do on her own. And she's immediately thwarted by her ultimate foil, this dude who would have been like prime for the empire picking and he's just a, a little baby who's like, oh, cool, the Empire. They got, they could have gotten some things right. It wasn't that bad, right? <laughs> and it's one generation. It's one generation away, which... What is he, like 32 and she's 49? Yeah, he's, yeah she's in her late 40s. And uh, I like that this sort of side mission is about more personal or smaller scale political intrigue and also that Han and Leia talk about going on an adventure and maybe having like space smooches. I thought a really relatable moment for that with Leia is that she is 49. She's been a part of the, um, she's, you know, she's been royalty and she's grown up through that. But since she was like in her, as a child, she was sitting in, in these meetings and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So she was learning about democracy. She was learning about sort of like her for so long. And yet at 49, she's just like, what's the point? And I felt that. I yeah. felt someone who had worked so hard and was trying to do so much. But at the end of the day, they still felt like just one person trying to do everything but unless you have a system that is you know in sync and really trying to push for change and if there weren't like 19,000 stipulations that we had to jump through to try and actually make one thing happen her going I want to retire peace out and I actually want to spend some quality time with the man that I love doing very little I was like I get that like, sign me up. Actually, how do you get a husband like Han first? Like, that's what I really want to know. Mm. Nom, nom, sign Hans, you know what to do. Use that hologram. Maybe don't marry him, but smooch him a lot. That would be my... I'll take it. Like yeah, I he... said, guys, my theory is I think that their marriage is actually pretty rock solid, even now when they're it's not like physically in the same book. place. Wait until Ben turns to the dark side. That's when things start but, to go bad. But Leia is already being sort of teased and provoked with Han's reputation, like once a smuggler, always a smuggler in her own biases. Yep. And- I kind of cool. like Bryn Riven when he pointed that out. He goes, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Like, I'm going to address all the shit that he did. And she was like blown away going, no one has ever been so forward and not dancing around that, but he, blazed, he blasted her with it. But the fact that he also backed it up by saying what, just because he joined 
the rebellion, everything he did before just automatically disappears. And I was like, ah, when can change actually come to effect? When, yeah. like, does a, pers- is a person who you were always become the, the person who you are? I don't know. I thought that was if a really trying interesting- to survive. If you're you're trying to get revenge, like what what where is the line? Real quick, Anthony Carboni, our buddy Anthony in the chat says Han Solo, good husband, said no one ever. I disagree. I think uh, that at this point he can be. I don't see them as a team. Sorry, I see him. He's- I see him as always prioritizing him. I, I saw he, her as the prize, but then they're stuff- They're too friggin' stubborn. Yeah, I don't see them as a team at all. All the time. But they're a, te- they're I, a team I, of individuals. They are a team of individuals. That's there what they're it is. a team. And the fact that she was <laughs> fantasizing about spending three months together with him on the ship, and his response was, we're gonna get sick of each other. I was like, That's He's insecure. Something. He's well, insecure, clearly. Grown ass man. Yeah, yep. You know what I want to point out that I think is really awesome? Again, in all of the flaws of the original movies that we love so much, like one of the flaws being Carrie Fisher in A New Hope was very young. And at one point, it seemed like she had a British accent. Nobody knew what the hell. Like, it's like, why is she speaking in a British accent? Page 32 of this book, page 32, has her talking about. Casturfo, like he has an aristocratic yeah. accent that Grand Moff Tarkin had spoken. And she goes, uh, you know, the one so many senior Imperial officers affected, the one she'd mocked when she and Tarkin last stood face to face. He explained and- it. I was wondering what that line of dialogue was. Because I was like, I don't remember any mocking. She wasn't mocking. She, oh, it was bad. I love it. No- <laughs> known it was your foul stench when I came aboard. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny I solved a plot hole like I, I i'm not a big fan of the retroactive solving of plot hole that was just writing but if you're if you're gonna do it in that like just a subtle beautiful dig beautiful yeah yeah um so we did a lot of talking about Star Wars overall. This happens with every first every time. Yeah. episode of <laughs> a book. We get really excited about what we're talking about. But we're going to keep talking about uh, specific plot points in the next episode. But even before then, we have an after show. But first, your homework. Finish chapter 16. Stop at chapter 17. This is on page 199 in your paperback copy. And we will tweet this out. And if you're me or Maude or Hector, we will text each other and say, where are we reading? Stop at 17. Stop at 17. For some reason, all the time. You got to have two bookmarks, right? One where you're at and one where you're going to. That's the that's oh, the deal. You guys, you're that's great. the deal. Okay, okay. Or you write it down and then you forget. And then you <laughs> next change. I had to do that almost every week. Come yeah, I, I, I felt like part of it was like, <laughs> um, but after you finish your homework or before, you can check out previous episodes of Nerdist Book Club on Nerdist and Geek and Sundry's YouTube or Geek and Sundry's Twitch. Please like and subscribe. Please also send us book recommendations. Uh, either we're on Goodreads. On good, we're on Goodreads. Send us books we should do on the show. But if you know us, which I hope you do, if you have specific recommendations for us, we like different things and similar things send them to us and uh mod where are we going right now what's happening yeah look straight after this i'm going to drop a tweet out but then we're going to head over to the uh geek bombs after show which happens and on the book club call that exists in uh, geek bombs discord now anyone can actually join the discord but to get access to the call area you have to be subscribed uh sorry you have to back geek bombs patreon the lowest tier and higher will get access just five dollars a month is the minimum one and you get a bunch of other perks as well original script yeah, I'm going to chat about that. I didn't sign an NDA. Woo! Uh, so yeah, head over there. We'll talk about that. And I also really want to dissect Leia and Han's relationship, what they're like, uh, why they work, why they didn't, all that kind of stuff. And we can actually talk about what went down in the first eight chapters also because we was you just get it over that one. But there Oops. you go. Guys, thank you so much. If you want to get involved, just head to patreon.com slash geekbomb. Sign up for that. And I'll see you over there on the Discord. And we'll see you next week. May the force be with you.
<laughs> I couldn't think of anything funny, so I just... Don't be a player, be a layer. Wait, can I get... Are we out? I'm, I'll bring my Akbar toys next Go get your Akbar. Go get your no. Akbar toy. No. Pecker. I also... <laughs>